and we are recording today's session. You will receive an email when it has been posted to our YouTube page and archived onto our website. Uh, my name is Becky Sanders. I'm the program director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. And uh, as part of our UMTRC webinar series, we asked Trevor Cunningham, one of my coworkers here at the Indiana Rural Health Association, to uh, speak to us about their Crossroads grant um, that they've been working on through HRSA. And he'll tell you all about it, but we were just um, awarded last night what we're calling Crossroads 2.0. So we're very proud of this program and, uh, and Trevor's contribution to the team. So um, you are all in listen only mode. We do have the Q&A open. We encourage you to use that Q&A to ask questions throughout. Trevor has given me permission to interrupt so that we can take care of those questions as we come across those topics. And uh, please do not use the chat function. Only use that if you have technical issues. Uh, put submitting your questions through the Q&A allow us to archive those. And if there's any questions we can't get to in our time today, then we can go back and answer them later. And also in the chat, um, there is a Q&A survey. Um, it's just a couple of short questions. And if you would fill that out at the end, we'd greatly appreciate it. So Trevor, I'll hand everything over to you. Great, thanks Becky. Um, so hi everyone, um, my name's Trevor and I'll continue with introductions in a minute, but quickly introduce the session. We're um, in building a telebehavioral health platform, a solution for treating patients diagnosed with mental health and substance use disorders living in medically underserved communities. Um, quick introduction of myself. Um, Again, I'm a project coordinator with the Indiana Rural Health Association. I have been with the organization um, for two years. Actually, yesterday was my anniversary. Um, and I was originally hired on to work um, for the Crossroads Partnership for Telehealth, which has been a very successful program. And again, we'll dive deeper in a few slides. Um, I was also a part of the IRHA Fellowship Program. Um, but obviously, due to COVID, um, we had to suspend that program. Um, it was a very successful program that we had uh, uh, last year as our inaugural year. Um, we had 12 different participants in that, um, and those are undergrads, graduates, and um, early careerists. And they work with mentors at the Indiana Rural Health Association to help create a community-based project and implement it and present in front of our board of directors. Um, we aren't very sure at this point if we're going to continue the program um, in the following year. But if you have any questions or if you want to talk more about it, feel free to um, email me at the end of the slides where my information will be. Um, again, we will probably meet sometime this fall to discuss the potential for continuing that program. Um, and then finally, I'm also a member of the grant writing team. Um, we were very excited to hear that we got Crossroads 2.0 which is very focused on teleneurology services. And we have a few new partners that will come live um, September 1 with that grant. So very, very excited for that. Um, I'm also a third year grad student um, getting my MHA, which is a master's of health administration and my master's in public health with a concentration in health policy and management. Um, those both degrees are from the IU Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health um, in Indianapolis. And then finally, um, I'm on the development committee. I am the co-chair um, alongside uh, Mr. Ryan Sutherland um, from Yale University. And um, that is through the student, uh, student assembly at the American Public Health Association. So if any questions about any of those um, relate to you, please feel free to message me at any time. Um, real quick, um, I want to give a quick current situation. Um, this is gonna be very brief, but I wanted to outline a couple of different maps um, of the United States. Um, this one really highlights the uh, professional shortage areas that we see in the United States. Um, the darker areas being the more intensive areas where less providers um, are practicing. Um, you can see them in states such as Nevada and New Mexico where um, it is very hard to live um, if you have a mental health disorder. Um, Moving on to uh, the UMTRC service area. This is just a zoomed in 
um, of the four states that UMTRC represents. Um, with Indiana, you can see that two are, the two main areas are north central and south central uh, areas, as well as um, the southwest tip of the state. Um, with Illinois, it's again the southern part of the state and more towards the eastern part. Um, this map comes from HRSA, so obviously the map isn't perfect. Um, you can see some of the areas are actually going over into the water uh, in Michigan. Um, but Michigan, you can see towards the northern part of the state, you can see more um, shortage areas. And um, with Ohio, again, similar to the state of Indiana, um, the south central area being very barren for um, health professionals. And then um, typically on the corners of the state, we can see a little darker areas. Um, this shows the mental health facilities um, in the United States. And something I really want to point out, um, first off, is how Nevada and New Mexico have very limited um, facilities. And this is just because, I mean, there, there's many, many disparate areas in those states where um, the population may be very slim. But if you Take a quick look at Alaska. That is one um, outlier that's very fascinating to me because it's, it's very limited in their population, but yet they have many, many mental health facilities. Um, so kudos to them. Um, here we can see the UMTRC service area and most of these states kind of represent where the mental health shortage areas um, lie. So again, north, and, north central and south central of Indiana, um, towards the east part of the state for Illinois again towards some some spotty areas in northern Michigan and um, south central uh, Ohio as well as the corners um, especially in the northern part of the state. Um, again these are just indicators to show you um, the lack of resources for people who live in these really um, rural areas um, in these midwestern states. So now I'm going to dive in to the Crossroads Partnership for Telehealth um, and what this program has accomplished and where we are currently. Um, so really quick uh, to disclose any information, um, all the programs mentioned um, in this presentation were funded by the Health Resources and Service Administration. Um, I personally have no conflicts of interest and neither does anyone on my team. Um, this product was supported through the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Um, Health Resources and Service Administration and the Department of Health and Human Services. And the grant ID is G01RH32154. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that the information, conclusions, and opinions made by us um, are not endorsed by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, HRSA, or um, Health and Human Services and should not be inferred. So, quick overview of what the Indiana Rural Health Association is. I'm sure most of you are familiar if you are at this webinar, um, but what we do is we provide the, the best care that we can to our members and the populations living in rural Indiana. Um, so we do have programs that can um, step over state lines, but our primary, primary goal is to treat and um, help provide resources for individuals living in rural communities. Here are the five pillars that IRHA is based off of. Um, the first being leadership. Um, we want to be um, strong in our business partner network in our Indiana statewide rural health network so we can provide um, comprehensive leadership to our network hospitals um, so that they can get the best resources possible. Um, and going hand in hand is with education. Um, we provide different grant opportunities for them um, and individuals living in the rural communities so that they can be better well educated um, so that they have better health outcomes for the future. Um, advocacy is another important element. We, we love to talk to our elected officials at the federal and state levels um, and really show them how effective um, our grants and how um, um, appreciated the hospitals are uh, for the programs that we offer them. Um, we want politicians to really consider the effects that rural health have on the populations that they serve. Um, next one being collaboration. Um, we, we, we have created more and more relationships, um, specifically with organizations like the Luger Center for Rural Health, um, the Indiana Primary Healthcare Association, and the Indiana Hospital Association. We don't necessarily look at them as competitors. We look at them as collaborators and trying to create 
better health for individuals living in the state. Um, and then finally, resource development. Um, this has been very prevalent during COVID-19. Um, individuals at the organization like Dr. Amna Anwar um, were very critical in getting PPE to provider hospitals and um, trying to just make sure that they have all the resources they needed um, during this current ep epidemic. And I would even add to um, the unofficial sixth arm of the organization being research. Um, our organization has continuously improved our research capabilities um, with different HIPAA compliance servers and um, data coordinators. And we are taking that more, more seriously because we want to understand the effects our programs are having um, on the state and the people we um, provide them to. On the next slide, um, we're just gonna take a quick look at the background of the grant. Um, again, this is funded through the Health Resources and Service Administration for our offices, Federal Office for Rural Health Policy and Office for Advancement of Telehealth. It took me a long time to remember those, um, and I still kind of get um, dry mouth when I try and explain that, but yes, um, our grant is um, a continuation, continuing grant through the Office for Advancement of Telehealth under HRSA. Um, we really saw the need for telehealth doing the needs assessment. Um, and that was really clear when we saw that um, about 20%, nearly one fifth of individuals in Indiana will experience a depressive disorder sometime in their lifetime. Um, and this is becoming more and more prevalent as the years go on. And then we saw that about 63% of the state was classified as a health professional shortage area. So again, trying to expand telehealth so that we can serve those individuals who may have to drive extended miles to um, that service line. Um, just because they live far away does not mean they sh deserve any less care than someone living in an urban area. Here are the two, object two main objectives of the grant. Um, and I'll quickly read those off, but I'll explain more on the next slide. Um, we wanted to develop and maintain a telehealth network that will increase access to behavioral health care services in rural communities and conduct evaluations of patient utilization. Um, and then the next objective is to grow the evidence base for assessing the effectiveness of telebehavioral health care services for patients, providers, and payers. Here on the next slide, we can look at our methodology. And it really starts out with us recruiting hospitals. Um, we work with a great um, gentleman named Phil Ellis, who runs our Indiana Statewide Rural Health Network and has connections with rural hospitals all around the state. And we start there by providing the resource to them. We say, hey, we have this grant opportunity. Would anyone be interested? And then we go farther in that process. And if that doesn't work, we typically do cold calls. We present on other associations' um, webinars. We try and get the word out there as much as possible. Um, because at the end of the day, this, we, we, are, we act as salesmen, but we are trying to provide free services and actually incentives to help improve access to care. Um, so moving on to the next point, um, we provide telebehavioral health equipment to them. Um, and that includes medical cards, tablets, and video conferencing applications. Um, we also try and give them resources, these hospitals, if they don't have current providers in behavioral health to get them resources such as IRIS or virtual consults, different facilities that can provide behavioral health services um, to these systems through a contract base rather than internal providers. And then uh, this last method being very um, close to our second objective is we want to measure the effectiveness of the different metrics that we collect. Um, so we have been about 25 different metrics that we collect by each facility. Um, including clinical instruments, which we will discuss later um, in this discussion. Um, but we want to evaluate the screening tools, um, the diagnostic information, the CPT codes, um, and basic demographic information, and then how much mileage they are saving um, by going to a rural health clinic rather than a um, urban uh, metropolitan area. Here are the five sites that we are currently working with. Um, the first being Reed Health, which has been with us since the beginning. Uh, we were initially with them when they were Fayette Regional Health, and now they have become Reed Health Connorsville Outpatient Medical Center. Um, we have had great success with them. Um, they, this site, just to give you a point of reference, an individual living in Connorsville, Indiana, would have to travel 
30 to 35 minutes to the nearest facility, which is Richmond, Indiana. Um, and that would be a total of 60 to 70 uh, minutes round trip. Whereas they can go to their neighborhood outpatient center and see a individual um, through a telehealth service. So saving them many, many minutes and many miles um, so that they can get care and services they need, um, especially if they have busy schedules. Um, next being Gibson General Hospital. This is um, the newest facility that we have on our list. Um, they will be going live with two sites. They currently have one at the Fort Branch location. Um, and we've seen successful encounters with them so far, um, seeing about 20 patients a week. Um, third being Perry County. Um, we currently are working out of their outpatient center in Tell City, um, but we hope to um, continue some more services in their emergency department at some point in the future. Uh, Davies Community Hospital, which is our only internal site. Um, so they provide a behavioral health unit in their inpatient sector in their hospital. Um, and they again have shown very promising um, results by using this equipment. Um, they use primarily just one provider. Um, she's an MD and um, they have shown to be very effective um, in treating their patient populations, especially their elder population um, around the county. And then finally, um, Virtual Consult MD, which is um, a great provider and they're um, increasingly um, adding new facilities all throughout the state and throughout the country. Um, we work very closely with their CEO, Dr. Uh, Koshel, and um, we hope to continue work with them um, in the future. So um, just to wrap up, that was a quick overview of the program. I can get into more details of the successes we found, um, but I just wanna leave you with just a couple of quick points. Um, what behavioral health services currently exist in your community or target population? Would your organization benefit from telebehavioral health services? And then finally, what concerns or questions um, do you have when implementing a telebehavioral health service? Um, and you can think about these, and if you have questions, we can talk more during the slides, after the slides. I hope to leave about 10 minutes for questions um, at the end of the slides, so um, we can have a discussion there. Or um, I will also be sharing my email address, um, so we can set up a meeting, we can set up a phone call, and we can talk further in implementing uh, practices of telebehavioral health. So moving on to the stuff I'm sure most of you came here to see, um, I will primarily be talking about outpatient ambulatory centers. Um, I will mention emergency departments a few times, but this is more targeted towards outpatient mental health uh, centers. So talking about the equipment, um, what do you need to get started? Um, the most important thing when talking about telehealth is we need to make sure we have infrastructure and broadband to even support um, this, uh, this service line. Um, we've worked with centers that have had, um, have had issues with Wi-Fi, and this is something that most rural health clinics, I'm sure, um, uh, suffer from, but this is something that is needed for um, implementation of the iPads and the video conferencing applications. Um, but of course, we need efficient Wi-Fi, and um, I, I, I always try and stress this as much as possible with a welcoming environment. Um, these individuals are coming here for mental health treatment or substance use treatment, so it has to be different than a normal primary care setting. We need to have um, much more supportive staff more, um, more smiles, more people welcoming those individuals, making them feel safe and secure because um, especially individuals living in rural communities, we know how stigmatized um, mental health can be. And then finally, um, emergency departments. Um, I will probably not talk about this much longer in this slide or in this uh, presentation, but um, we've seen emergency departments be very effective. And when a patient comes in, for, a, uh, for some type of emergency and they mention to the provider that they are feeling depressed, anxious, um, any number of different mental health issues um, that the provider can virtually um, have a cons consultation with a, another provider and have that um, practitioner provide the best resources and diagnostic coding um, possible that that emergency physician may not be able to offer. Um, so we've seen it successful in that capacity as well. Um, going down to medical carts, um, we personally like to mention that we are um, technology agnostic. We don't try and um, uh, 
support any uh, specific uh, organization, but we will mention that we use Jayco medical carts. We've also had very uh, successful interactions with American Well as well. Um, so again, I'm not endorsing them. I'm just saying that we've used them and they have become successful, um, which might sound contradictory. Um, but continuing on with devices, we usually use tablets. Um, they're very cost effective. They, they, uh, they really range just from a couple hundred dollars, um, whereas a laptop may be a thousand, couple thousand dollars. Um, we've also seen other facilities use televisions which I, again, will touch on farther when we talk about the patient experience, but um, typically we suggest using a tablet just because of how simple and easy it is to use, um, mainly because of how easy um, the user face is. Um, continuing on with the equipment, um, on our left, we can see what the Jayco medical cart looks like. This is what we use at our facilities. Um, it has four rollers on the side. It has a handle on the side for, um, moving the equipment up and down. Um, you can move that iPad or tablet from side to side. Um, and it's just very, very, it's very simple and easy to use by the clerical staff, clinical staff, and uh, the patient. Um, the utilization and usage, um, we typically see um, clinical staff. So usually MAs um, or nurses will be using the equipment most. Um, Sometimes the clerical staff will be, but it's again, usually the MAs who are um, at that session before the provider. But usually practitioners will not be using the equipment, obviously because they will be at the distant site. Um, these, these carts are just so easy to use because they're so thin um, that it's really easy to move from room to room. Um, we highly suggest keeping, if you have two of them, um, keeping one in a, in a common storage area and having one as the roaming one. So you can have one as a backup, um, just in case that iPad was damaged or just in case anything happened to that cart in general. Um, you always have a backup. Um, storage and setup, I mean, this is pretty basic stuff, but we always suggest charging every night. Um, there is a cord attached to these um, Jayco medical carts where, excuse me, you just have to plug it in to a wall outlet um, once every night. Um, and then obviously in the world that we live with, with COVID um, and hopefully before COVID, we want to be disinfecting these carts every usage. Um, we don't want the providers to feel um, unsafe or um, uh, feel that they might, you know, be touching someone's equipment that other patients have touched prior. So just making sure there's general upkeep on those equipment. Um, Here's the patient experience slides. Um, and I really want to emphasize how important this is, especially in the mental health world. Um, this is typically what we can see out of a rural health clinic. Um, and I don't want to dog on any of these clinics, but because uh, not many of them have the resources to improve the facilities. And most of them use these facilities to uh, provide vitals as well as provide the counseling as well. But this kind of shows, you know, um, kind of awkward lighting um, muted colors, um, really just kind of an unwelcoming environment. I, I, I don't want to um, make it seem like I am stressing the fact that uh, these can't be welcoming environments, but um, more can be done within these um, facilities. And here's a few examples of that. Um, these are two examples from the partners we work with. Um, both have different lighting structures. So the patient can control how dim, how dark, or how light the room is and how, what their comfort levels are. There's also very, very soft ambient music being played um, that helps calm individuals down. And you can also see wall art on the wall. So this is really helping the individual feel um, that sense of um, personableness. Um, we also see that these facilities are using televisions and that the individual is sitting on a couch. So it really, they're really trying to make it feel like it's a face-to-face -face encounter um, and more personable as well. Um, yeah, so it, if, if a facility can afford these changes, we highly suggest doing it because again, it makes the patient feel more welcomed and it makes them feel as if they are um, being treated um, maybe just a slightly bit better. Um, next section I want to talk about is the software selection. 
Um, these are just a couple of options that we've used in the past. Um, again, technology agnostic is our group um, motto, but um, we typically use Zoom. Um, there were some issues with Zoom prior to or when COVID was starting, um, but from what we believe is that all those bugs were fixed. Um, we actually pay for a subscription for Zoom. I believe it's 10 $15 a month, um, and we get a HIPAA compliant Zoom room, which is fully um, protected from encryption and um, makes the provider feel more secure, and as well as the patient. So no PHI will be distributed um, or stolen from that encounter. Um, we've also seen um, some groups use doxy.me. Um, I'm sure if any of you have done telehealth, um, especially at, I think IU Health has adopted this pr platform. Um, it's been pretty efficient. Um, again, it's a, it's a very easy service to use, um, as well as video. You really can't go wrong with any of these. Um, I would highly suggest not probably using WebEx. Um, Zoom, doxy.me, or video would probably be my options, I would suggest, because of how secure um, they've made their um, applications. Um, moving on to security, I wanted to make a couple of points. Um, what we do with our safety features is we lock devices with a passcode. I know some of this sounds probably very basic, but I, I want to um, iterate how important it is. Um, we provide all uh, your IT and your IS department should be the ones that have all the passcodes and all the information for that. Um, frontline staff, for example, don't need passcodes um, to change applications. They only need passcodes for certain um, video conferencing applications and actually to access the iPad. Um, we also disable all the applications. So we use, um, we use Apple iPads with our um, current program, but uh, we use a thing called guided access when the patient is actually being seen. So when that patient is being seen, they cannot manipulate the Zoom room. They can't change any um, any factors relating to the meeting itself. Um, they can't control the volume, can't shut off the iPad. Um, but we have not seen any issues of that. We haven't seen any patients being violent towards the iPad or, um, uh, or trying to do that. We just use that as um, an extra safety measure. Um, what we do with the settings application is uh, we, use, um, we, we, we use the program called Downtime and uh, the apps restriction page. Um, so we restrict usage to all the different applications other than settings um, and uh, find my iPhone and um, whichever video conferencing application that is. And that can all be found under screen time. Um, it's a very handy tool. And again, you know, we, that screen time passcode that we use for that is usually given to the IS department and the frontline staff really don't have any um, potential of trying to re-download or pay for applications. Not that they necessarily would, but again, we just use that as a secondary method um, as for protection. And then we continuously use um, Find My iPhone to help track the iPad, um, just in case it was ever stolen or misplaced, um, that we can find that um, through our um, third party um, email system. Um, next is staff training. Um, what we've seen when we do staff trainings on the equipment is that there is definitely a generational divide. Um, the generation I was raised in is very technology um, savvy. Um, and the generations um, that may be a little older than mine um, typically aren't. And I don't want to categorize people, but that is what we've seen um, in the past. So it's really, um, it's really not, uh, an instance of whether you get it or you don't get it, it's that we need to take extra steps in ensuring that all individuals understand how to use the iPad properly, not just explaining it one time to them and uh, making them get it. You know, we gotta work with individuals who may not be as technology advanced as others on the team. Um, we also create a step-by-step -step manual. Um, this is incredibly helpful. Um, because this has passcode information, this has step-by-step -step instructions on how to um, incorporate a, uh, a meeting for a patient. Um, I have a template for that, so if anyone's interested in um, using something similar to that, I'm more than happy to forward my PDF version to you. Um, that is available knowledge. I would just have to redact some of the information. 
Um, but that has been very helpful, um, especially with our frontline staff. Um, next, we want to evaluate how the program's doing. Um, just ensure proper usage. Just make sure that no apps are being downloaded, no one's abusing the camera feature. Um, again, we, we, we haven't seen that. Usually it's a very professional environment at these clinics, but again, we just wanna make sure that that's not being abused. Um, and then we want to reevaluate training needs. Um, and this is primarily done through staff meetings and monthly touch bases. Just an environment where people can feel safe and they can um, address concerns or questions they may have um, and really um, get to the points uh, that need to be fixed. Um, next, we'll be talking about billing. This is a little more substantial, uh, probably a little more helpful to individuals rather than the stuff I just went through. Um, here is the billing model that we have used um, with the patient to being at the originating site. And I also want to iterate that this is pre-COVID. So a lot of the things that we'll be discussing are pre-COVID and probably going to be post-COVID. Um, but I will also mention the waivers associated with the pandemic currently. Um, so like I was mentioning, the patient comes to the originating site and is billed a facility fee, um, which is a HCPCS code, which we'll talk about um, in a few minutes. And then the specialist is at the distance site. So usually at their home, or a separate office where they can virtually see that individual. And they will obviously bill the typical professional fee. And the rule of thumb that you really want to go by is that we, you bill as you would as a normal face-to-face -face encounter. Um, originating sites, um, the beneficiary or the patient will come to the facility um, to experience the telebehavioral health, um, but they have to be, that facility has to be located in a county outside of a metropolitan area. Um, this is decided by the U.S. Census Bureau, and then, or it could be out in a rural health professional shortage area, and this is decided by HRSA, and that's, those are both easy to understand. All you can do is just Google or search um, HRSA health professional shortage areas, and you can see if your facility um, fits one of those. Um, some of the sites that we've worked with are hospitals, critical access hospitals, primarily rural health clinics and thoroughly qualified health centers, FQHCs. I wanna make a quick note, um, you can provide services, billable services through skilled nursing facilities, um, but you have to ensure that it's a skilled nursing facility and not a nursing home. So we've had many questions from local hospitals that have a need for services at their local nursing home, but they have to be a skilled nursing facility and have uh, um, a provider that can actually provide the services. So just to make sure that if it's a normal nursing home, they are not allowed to use the originating site fee. They have to be a skilled nursing facility. This next slide um, shows what you should be um, billing for the originating site fee. It's the HCPCS code Q3014. And I believe last time I looked this up, it's about a $26 fee. Um, some facilities operate telehealth and don't realize that they can be also billing for this service, and that is revenue that they are drastically missing. Um, so make sure if you are wanting to implement this program to continuously use that Q3014 code um, during every encounter, um, because that is extra money going into your pockets. Um, so here we can kind of get into more of COVID and how the waivers work. Um, I don't want to read this um, word by word, but in unique situations, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has the authority um, under the Social Security Act to initiate 1135, um, which will modify or temporarily waive requirements by Medicare, Medicaid, the Child Health Insurance Program, or the Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act requirements. Um, there are many different types of these waivers, but we're gonna be discussing um, the blanket waiver. Um, this is really just an idea of getting better access to the beneficiaries, the, the patients. And uh, I wanna know also when a blanket waiver is issued, the individual sites do not have to apply individually for those. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, this also gives flexibility to the providers. Again, we really want to stress the access to care. We want people to be secure in the way that they um, absorb services and feel safe under the current guidelines um, through CMS. Um, 
Here we can get a little more idea of at how the at-home behavioral health has gone. Um, most of our facilities since March have moved to providing services at home rather than the patient actually going to an originating site. Um, so unfortunately not using that originating site fee, but this is so much more convenient for the providers. Um, I was just on a call um, yesterday with our provide with our um, contact at um, a facility for the Crossroads Partnership for Telehealth, and she had mentioned that they went from a 20 per 25 percent no show um, or no call to all the way to a six percent no call no show. So these at home facility uh, meetings have really helped providers, and they are more booked than ever because people are more comfortable um, getting their mental health coverage it seems like at a home setting rather than a brick and mortar setting. Um, but again, we don't know when those might be taken away by CMS, um, but right now this is the current situation. Um, these can also, um, HHS highly uh, supports doing this for medication consultation and then mental health counseling as well. Um, here's four points that I wanted to add. Again, I hate reading slides, but um, these are our very important. Um, uh, we they, uh, providers are now allowed to conduct telehealth um, with patients located in their homes. So that has not been a practice done before now, um, at least with the federal government. Um, next, we have practice remote care, um, even across state lines. Again, very important. Um, deliver care to both established and new patients um, through this at-home service. And then finally, the most or not the most important, but the most significant probably to billers and practice managers are bill for telehealth services, um, both video and audio only as if they were in person. So just keep that in mind. Keep continuing your billing services um, as you would um, in a brick and mortar facility other than that originating site fee. Here you can see a couple of different providers um, that we've used. Um, usually if you're a physician or some type of doctor level provider, you will be conducting the management of the plans and actually billing for the services. Um, that differs from state to state, so just keep that in mind. Um, usually what we see is we see nurse practitioners and licensed clinical social workers actually providing the medication consultation and the mental health counseling. Um, so those are the two popular ones, at least in the state of Indiana that we've seen. We've also seen licensed mental health counselors, um, clinical nurse specialists, uh, clinical psychologists, which are very rare, but those are typically used more for the medication um, interventions. And then registered dietitians or nutrition professionals, which we very rarely see, but have seen once or twice. Um, this next slide shows the distance site billing protocols that I just want to share with you. Um, clearly using the appropriate CPT codes and HCPCS codes is very important practice to use. Um, I wanted to also address to add the place of services, the POS um, 02 for telehealth. Um, and then finally, if you're billing under the critical access hospital um, optional payment method too, um, then you want to add the GT modifier or the 95 modifier because this process allows um, for video conferencing and audio encounters. Um, make sure we, you're not using the GQ method, which is the store and forward method, meaning that um, that is pre-recorded and sent to the patient. Here's a quick list of um, HCPCS codes and CBT codes that we've used at uh, most of the facilities. Um, not all of these come up, but uh, a majority of them do. Um, I'll just give you a few minutes to look at those, a few seconds to look at those billing codes. Um, and I can go back if anyone has questions about those, but I'll go in more detail in just a few seconds. Here um, is the evaluation and management section. Um, if any of you are familiar with um, billing CPT codes, you'll be familiar with this um, information. Um, so to bill for these evaluation and management codes, we need to have three key components, um, established history, uh, physical examination, and a medical decision-making um, uh, decision. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, the best reference is obviously your CPT coding book um, for all this information because every code is so much significantly different. Um, 
Other contributing factors that can uh, affect this is the counseling, coordination of care, um, the nature of the presenting problem, and time. Um, usually we see the most, st the strongest indicator of which code you're going to use is basically based on the time frame that the patient is seen with the provider. Here um, I'm going to quickly look through the initial visits. Um, when billing for uh, the office or other outpatient facility, use 99202 through 99205 codes. Um, we usually see these conducted through the nurse practitioners. Um, people who may not be solely focused on uh, behavioral health, um, but we usually see face-to-face -face timing with these from 20, 30, 45 to 60 minutes um, for their initial visit. And moving on, this uh, 9079 to the 9079-2, um, these are the initial psychotherapy sessions. Um, these are for psychiatric diagnostic evaluations. Um, the first one being without medical um, services and the 90792 being with medical services. So that's the difference between those two. Um, these are usually conducted by LCSWs and licensed medical, mental health counselors. Um, and the pattern that we've typically seen is that um, these individuals are usually face-to-face -face encounters, um, mainly because when they are dealing with individuals with substance use, um, face-to-face -face encounters and more frequent encounters are more are needed more so um, continuing on with the follow-up um, when continuing with the office or the uh, other outpatient center we use 99212 to 99215 um, again those are dependent on the three components that I mentioned a couple slides previous um, but we see those face-to-face -face timings um, a little less um, at 10, 15, 25, and 40 minutes. Um, and then uh, if you're doing a follow-up for psychotherapy, um, usually that's 9832 to 9837. Um, just a couple of those codes are used, um, but those indicate 30, 45, and 60-minute sessions. Um, this is a slide that hopefully you won't have to use, but I wanted to put it in just as a secondary need, just in case there are any issues with the video conferencing applications. Um, we've seen some providers use this prior, but these codes are used 99441 to 99443. Um, these are telephone calls, and I believe they are reimbursed slightly less than the video conferencing. So um, highly suggest not using these as your primary um, interaction with patients, but they are a good tool if the patient is um, suffering with, from bad Wi-Fi or the video conferencing applications are for whatever reason not working properly. Um, but these are just really divided up between um, five to 10 minutes, uh, 11 to 20 minutes, and 21 to 30 minutes. Um, but again, highly recommend don't using these, but they are a good solution just in case um, your internet fails you. Um, these slides I'm going to go over pretty quickly. Um, all of you probably understand the collaborative care model. With the, um, this really isn't um, solely focused on outpatient. It can be, um, but this is the primary care provider will provide a referral for the patient to see um, a behavioral health specialist with the trained behavioral health manager um, in continued relationship with the patient um, and the psychiatric consultation coming from any number of different um, psychiatric focused uh, providers, um, creating that relationship with the patient and the primary care provider. Um, these are just some quick things to look at. Um, the uh, behavioral health manager needs to be educated or have uh, a specific specialty and have that continuous relationship with the provider and um, the patient or beneficiary. Um, care management can also be done remotely. Obviously, with the times that we're in, um, things are going to be done more remotely now than ever. So just keep that in mind. Um, again, real quick, I know we're kind of low on time, but this is, I just want to touch quickly on the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. Um, the diff different benefits um, being that it was ending uh, the substan sus substantial growth rate um, formula, um, and it's also transitioning from a fee-for-service model to a now value-based care model. 
um, as well as continuing uh, the existing quality reporting for a new um, universal system for all those um, different measurements. So that's it with billing. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any more questions. There are some things I wasn't able to address, obviously because of timing concerns, but again, I will show my email at the end of the presentation for any continuing questions or conversations prior or after this uh, session. The next, um, we're gonna be talking about screening tools. Um, real quick, those are just evidence-based um, survey instruments that are used for adolescents to adults. Um, we primarily use these to track the patients and track their well-being. So at the initial one month, two month, three month, et cetera, um, patient visits. Uh, screening tools are usually given by providers, but they don't necessarily have to be. They can be given before the session, um, primarily because when telehealth providers don't have a lot of time to uh, give the proper time frame for these instruments. So they don't usually provide them, but the face-to-face -face encounters um, more, more often than not have more time so that the patient can actually sit down and uh, uh, fully do the um, survey um, in a safe environment. But again, I want to mention that if telehealth providers are having a hard time conducting these, um, a simple instrument as providing the form to the patient prior to the appointment or providing it to them as they get to the facility are very important tools because we want the providers to have that information during the appointment. Um, so kind of building off that um, point, we want the clinic management and the information technology services to be involved in this. It's really a collaborative effort between all individuals working in the facility. Um, we want those ideally to be sent to the electronic medical record, um, it, either scanned or sent through a survey instrument used by Epic, Cern, or whichever system you're using. Um, and then so that the provider can have that at that appointment so they can evaluate the severity that that patient is suffering with depression, anxiety, any, any number of um, different instruments that you would prefer to use. The next slide shows um, some different clinical instruments that we suggest using. Um, the basic ones being general anxiety disorder, so the GAD-7, um, PHQ-9, which is the patient health questionnaire, which most people are familiar with, or the drug use disorders identification test, which is the DUDIT. Here um, is a quick look at what the PHQ-9 looks like. Um, it's graded on a scale of zero to 27. Um, for example, the first question says little interest or uh, pleasure in doing things. So if an individual is um, mod or fairly happy with those decisions, they can answer not at all, or they can answer to all the way to nearly every day. So if a patient is scoring a 27, that means that severe major depression uh, may exist in that patient um, and should be treated um, as differently as someone who may be scoring much lower on this exam. Um, same with the GAD-7, very similar, very, very, very similar to exam. Um, but we also see that um, the first question saying feeling nervous or anxious or on edge. Again, they have the option of writing not at all or nearly every day. So this is scored at 21. Um, and again, those patients having a score closer to 21 are more at risk for anxiety disorders. Next is the DUDIT, which um, we have found very helpful with um, treating patients with any type of substance misuse um, disorders. Um, the do scores out of 11 questions and the purpose is to identify uh, the use of drugs and the various drugs related problems that that patient may be going through. Um, and a score indicated over 25 uh, indicates to the provider that a patient may be highly um, uh, highly able to use drugs and might be dependent on them. Uh, this next slide shows what the DUDIT kind of looks like. It's a very large, it's, it's, it's a little bit larger than the PHQ-9 or GAD-7, so I wanted to just share a couple of questions with you. Um, the first question being, how often do you use drugs and other, um, other than alcohol? And this indicates never, once a month or less, and then it continues on from a score from zero to four for each question, and then obviously scored from a zero to 45 metric. Um, I wanted to quickly uh, go over these. Um, 
Dr. Amna Anwar, who runs our Indiana Rural Opioid Consortium, um, shared these with me. These are just different instruments that she highly suggests using because they're ESPERT recommended, and that stands for uh, Screening, Brief Intervention, Referral to Treatment, um, which is highly focused at Indiana University and um, is a very effective um, uh, model used by some providers. Um, but just an example of some of these um, I wanted to say was the audit, which is very close to the DUDIT, um, and then DAST, and then uh, BSTAD as well. Um, these are two specific ones for opioid use disorder. Um, the opioid risk tool is uh, shown to be very effective. Obviously, you can see that on the right, it divides uh, the two uh, individuals by male and female. It's based on your history and other different factors. It's provided to patients at the initial visit. Um, and uh, it shows that you know three or, three or fewer indicates low risks, four to seven indicates moderate risk, and anything larger than eight indicates very high risk um, of opioid misuse. And this is the ASSIST model. This is alcohol smoking and uh, substance involvement screening test. Um, highly recommended by the World Health Organization. Has seven separate questions. Um, can be used by the screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment setting. Um, so just wanted to give those a quick highlight as well. Um, measurement tools. Um, these are very important as well when um, evaluating the program. Um, I won't read this, um, but this is um, just a quote from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement webpage. Um, these, these measurement tools really help indicate from an operational standpoint how your program is doing, what changes could be made, and how the processes could be better for, processes and outcomes could be better for the patient. So here are three quick examples of those. Um, I'm not going into in incredibly detail of each of these, but I just want to make them um, available to you so you can do more research on the back end for these. Um, the outcome measures um, are exactly what they mean. These are outcomes associated with the provider using, or the patient using the telebehavioral health um, service and hopefully having a positive outcome um, with it and not seeing much of a difference between um, virtual and face-to-face -face encounters. Um, and then uh, the process measures, how can we make um, operations easier with um, the clerical staff, the clinical staff, um, the provider, how can we make sure that we're keeping on time with the appointments needed? And then finally is the balance measures so that we understand that each um, department that we are monitoring is having equitable uh, measures. So one may be doing a lot better than the other because a lot more time and effort is being put on those. So we don't want to have other departments or other service lines being hindered um, by the use of more resources towards another section. Um, I also want to suggest using the Donna Bedian framework is very helpful when evaluating these metrics. Um, the Anderson a day is also very efficient, um, but I would also suggest using the Institute for Healthcare Improvements um, modeling system, which is the triple aim, which evaluates cost, access, and uh, the quality of care delivered to the patient. Hey, Trevor. Yes. We've got a question. Have you ever seen the assist tool been, uh, being used as a screening tool? I, I personally have not. Um, I uh, want to iterate that with our program, we, we primarily use the PHQ-9, GAD-7, the DUDIT, and the PROMISE, which is a different tool for evaluating well-being. I have personally not used the ASSIST tool, um, but I wanted to mention that because I've seen it be effective in other cap in capacities as well. Um, and I'll quickly just go to the next slide because that wraps up my presentation. Um, here's, if anyone has any more questions that I can address, um, my email's here as well. So if you don't feel comfortable asking these in this session, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you outside of the webinar. So. Um, yeah, Becky, if you have any more questions, please let me know. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I'm going to open things up here. Please uh, put your questions in the Q&A. And um, <clears throat> while you're, you're doing that, um, Autumn, would you go ahead and put the link to the survey again in the chat? I 
had so I had a question myself, but I didn't write it down, and now I don't remember what it was. So, I want to thank you very much, Trevor, for your presentation today. Um, oh, I know what it was. So. Um, I get the emails from the National Rural Health Association. So there, you were talking about MACRA, mm -hmm. and I started thinking about CHART. We don't know too much about that. I don't know if you've looked into that at all, but it's a, a new payment methodology for uh, rural health care participants. And it looks to be very interesting. What was the acronym for that? CHART, C-H-A-R-T. I've heard it been mentioned a few times, but I have not personally um, done any investigation on it, but that is something that I will look into. Yeah, uh, it, it was an executive order um, by the Trump administration maybe a week ago, and mm -hmm. I think they had a, a call on it earlier this week. Okay, great. So it's, it's not, it's one of those things that's gonna be coming in the future. Is a recording available of that um, session? I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I will look that up and let you know. Are there any other questions from the audience today? All right. Well, thank you so much again, Trevor, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah. And you will receive an email in a, a couple of days with the link to the recording and where you can get the slides. Thank you and have a great day.